afternoon. Uh, welcome to our seminar um, where we will go back, so to say, to our local staff. And uh, I uh, think we know Ivana, but for those who don't know her, uh, she's a PhD student. student of Andra Boyer. And the uh, topic of her paper uh, will uh, concern uh, machine translation and uh, zero parallel data. So the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you for the introduction. So as, as I said, I am a PhD student. I'm just finishing my studies. I have just submitted my thesis. And now I would like to uh, present to you some uh, portions of my research. Uh, my talk will be about the role of pseudo parallel data in unsupervised machine translation. Unsupervised machine translation is, uh, is a topic or a focus of my research for the past uh, five years. And um, I have focused on various um, scenarios where unsupervised machine translation works or doesn't work. And now I would like to show you um, what my exper uh, experiments, uh, how were concluded, and uh, what are the methods that uh, we contributed to this, uh, to this um, research field of unsupervised MT. So what's even the motivation for unsupervised machine translation and what it is? So uh, we are talking about translation trained without any translation resources. So uh, we train uh, machine translation models without ever showing them what a translation looks like. We simply assume that if we show them enough uh, data in uh, two languages, uh, enough text separately without any alignments that they will be able to understand these languages and somehow use their internal representations to align uh, to align them and find the cross-lingual signal which is present in monolingual data. Uh, the motivation is that uh, we know that standard supervised uh, neural machine translation models work very well but they require large uh, parallel corpora for training. And such data is not available for uh, many language pairs in the world. And uh, that's why it's, it's important to, uh, to focus also on uh, languages that uh, now don't have access to any of the uh, nat uh, natural language processing technologies that we are, we are uh, used to and we take for granted, but there are still many languages which are excluded. So focusing on such unsupervised stra uh, strategies may help uh, also uh, for these uh, languages and for communities that, that speak them. Mm. Uh, it's always possible to try to uh, collect some translations for any language pair, but especially uh, for the languages which are very uh, distant from English uh, or which are spoken by um, a f not a very big community of people, it is difficult to to get some uh, to get such uh, to get such translations. The annotations are very expensive. So that's why in the year two thousand eighteen uh, there was. Uh, and, uh, this uh, field of unsupervised MT sort of started when uh, the two authors uh, authors show, showed that it's actually possible to uh, train MT only uh, on monolingual text. Later on, other researchers pointed out at the limitation of this technique because it uh, it doesn't work always. I will speak about that later. But uh, but the uh, the initial idea that this is possible was presented in 2000, 2018. Um, so, uh, I already uh, said that uh, the idea of uh, these models is that they uh, try to learn to understand uh, languages separately and uh, or they try to uh, somehow find a semantically meaningful way to, uh, to create their internal representations. The underlying idea behind this is that uh, no matter what language we use, the world is always the same. The, the, the way we speak is grounded in the real world. And uh, that's why the relationships with, between uh, words are, should be similar in, the, in every language, because also the objects in the real world 
relate uh, equivalently, no matter how we speak about them. Uh, unsupervised models try to exploit, exploit the similarity. Uh, but the problem is that uh, I said that uh, that, these, uh, that the way we speak is grounded in the real world. But also what matters is what kind of texts we show to the unsupervised models. Because if we show them two texts in uh, which talk about something completely different, suddenly this underlying assumption isn't true anymore. So uh, we have to, so when I will be later speaking about my experiments, we always have to keep this in mind that whenever uh, unsupervised techniques struggle, it is because there is a problem in this underlying assumption. So what are these underlying assumptions? So, as I said, uh, the texts that we show to, um, to the machine translation model have to speak about the, roughly the same topic. So that means that there needs, needs to be uh, a domain overlap between the, uh, between the text. Also, uh, the, uh, the techniques have the best results when languages are similar. This is a problem because especially for the languages which are very low resource, they often come from, very, uh, from language families which are very linguistically far for, uh, from the languages that we want to tra translate them into for example, English. So uh, in our uh, methods, we try to design techniques that are less dependent on the language similarity. Uh, also, what's uh, the third assumption, and I'm sorry, I have a mistake here because it should be large monolingual data. So of course, we have no parallel data in the, uh, in the situation uh, where we want to use these models, but we, uh, we count on the fact that we have quite a lot of monolingual sentences in each of the languages that we want to translate to. And uh, when this is not true, then uh, we have a problem. The limit for uh, when uh, these techniques work, work or doesn't, was uh, said by some authors uh, to be around 100, uh, around 1 million sentences. In some of my experiments, it worked uh, with less. I have one language pair where we only had 200,000 uh, 200, uh, sentences for one of the languages, and still we were able to, uh, to reach some kind of translation quality. But, um, but in general, these are the, the assumptions. Here in this picture, you can see uh, an illustration of what I was earlier talking about, that the we assume that languages, that, that they are so-called isomorphic, that uh, they have, that um, the relationship between, relationships between words within each language are similar. And if we uh, look at this and imagine that this is, uh, it is just a 2D uh, illustration of uh, internal representations of, uh, of a model or of word embeddings. Uh, if they have this, uh, the same so-called shape, we are able to find a linear, uh, linear mapping between uh, the two spaces to find the translation, uh, to find the translation pairs. So uh, I said that uh, these, uh, this mapping works when some, uh, or ideally work, works when some underlying assumptions are met. We, um, we experienced this when we trained our first uh, unsupervised MT models, which were from Czech to German. And it uh, kind of um, um, pushed our hopes up because it really worked very well for, for this language pairs. This is just an illustration when we uh, trained word embeddings for uh, Czech and German, and we used one of the mapping techniques to, to align them. Uh, the, and we explored the cross-lingual uh, embedding space. We really saw how you know, the time expressions cluster together, how, uh, how geographical expressions cluster together. So there really the mapping happened. Of course, even in such ideal scenario, I would say, there are still problems. For example, we see how uh, here the, the numbers are very close to each other. Also, we saw that names are close to each other. And that, uh, that leads to the fact that even when unsupervised techniques work, they always have a problem with uh, translating names or numbers. 
So even when they pr produce very good translation that we would say that is almost perfect, there is one key problem and that's that they completely change the number or the, or the name. So from the point of view of the capability of the model, I would say it's good, but from, for practical uh, usability, it's very bad. So, uh, so that's uh, how, uh, how these techniques uh, can work in a high resource uh, scenario. However, for most of our uh, experiments, we used low resource language pairs because that's the use case for these, uh, for these uh, methods. Um, here uh, in this picture, you see all the languages that we experimented with. And you also see by the size of the bubbles, uh, which indicates uh, the num uh, number of monolingual sentences in each language, that if we train something on Czech and German, if you see the two big bubbles, and then we want to use it for translation from English to Manipur, for example, where the, the uh, number of monolingual sen sentences is so much lower that maybe not all of the, uh, not all of the benefits of these techniques uh, will transfer. So uh, also what we see here is that Czech and German, it's not only good because there is so much monolingual data, but also it's, uh, it's a very related language pair. It's both, uh, they both belong to the European, uh, the Indo-European Indo language family. Whereas um, uh, many of the languages that we experimented with are Indic languages. Uh, all of them come from different language, uh, language families. Uh, we also uh, experimented with uh, Georgian, which uh, belongs to, uh, an, which is an isolated language in the Kartmelian family and, uh, and several others. Uh, Assamese, Manipuri, Inuktitut as well, they use a different script. Uh, sort of um, less uh, less common one, which uh, also might be a problem for uh, for some of our methods. So I will I will get to that later. Uh, so as I said before, so there was an initial hype that yes, unsupervised uh, machine translation can work and it's cool. Uh, after the first papers in 2018, there was a uh, there was a lot of um, uh, new papers that appeared at almost every conference. And um, later on, uh, several researchers found that actually the problem of these uh, methods is that they work when they are not necessary. And when we actually need them, uh, they doesn't, uh, doesn't work very well. Uh, in my research, I was trying to find methods that would uh, sort of help because I find this very unfortunate. And uh, uh, in, in some cases, we were successful. Still, uh, the, this, uh, the underlying assumptions of domain overlap, uh, they, are, they, are, they are difficult to kind of come uh, to, uh, to solve because it's, it's something that, um, that we still haven't been able to, to figure out. Um, okay, now let me talk about the, the methodology that we used uh, for our experiments. Uh, so, so we uh, I was talking about uh, machine learning models that create internal representations uh, from monolingual texts. So how exactly does does this happen? So there are two uh, there are two uh, approaches. Uh, when we in this uh, talk, I will only focus on neural models, not phrase based, even though phrase based models are also relevant for unsupervised MT. So uh, for uh, unsupervised neur neural models, we can either pre-train uh, pre the model jointly by, by uh, showing, uh, showing it different sentences in, uh, from the monolingual text, or we can uh, train, for example, word embeddings uh, separately in the two languages and then use, uh, use um, an expose techniques which map maps them uh, to find the, the relationships. Uh, both for unsupervised phrase-based MT and neural MT, there is the, the design of the system is, uh, is the same. So we find the, an, or the idea behind the system is the same. We find an initial solution, which can be found, for example, by the pre-training or by the mapped, uh, um, mapped word embeddings. Where, as I showed on that picture, the model is able to find some some 
uh, at least some correspondences to be able to start from uh, an initial solution of low quality, but already better than a random initialization. And then the way the uh, the models are trained is by uh, iterative back translation, where they uh, create training uh, examples uh, by themselves. So the model uh, so the model is used to translate sentences and then tra trains itself on the same sentences. Um, as far as the pre-training strategies are concerned. So there are two, uh, two pre-training methods that we experimented with. Uh, the first one is uh, masked language modeling, where we, uh, where we pre-train a transformer encoder. And uh, it's trained to fill in, uh, fill in gaps from uh, in sentences. So it's trained to fill in uh, the correct words for, for the masked tokens. And then uh, we use another uh, training objective, which is already uh, trained for the entire encoder decoder model. And there, uh, the model is, uh, is trained to uh, reconstruct sentences. So it's presented with a noised version of a sentence where words have been shuffled, dropped, or uh, uh, they have been masked as well. And uh, it's, it's trained to reconstruct the, the correct sentence. This way, if we train these with these um, uh, objectives in a multilingual fashion, so we train jointly on all of the languages together, or all of them, sometimes it's only two, for the source and the language uh, model, but also this can be trained in a massively multilingual way, showing a, a model of 100, uh, 100 languages and uh, hoping that it will create uh, cross-lingual representations. Um, so that's that's why uh, that's how we are able to get the initial cross-lingual signal. Then, uh, how if we have a pre-trained model, how do we teach it to translate? It it only now can sort of understand text or represent text, but it still have, has zero translation capabilities. So one way, the common way, which is our baseline, is. Uh, is the back translation that I mentioned, where the model is trained uh, only on synthetically generate, uh, generated translations. And these uh, translations are of increasing quality because uh, initially when the model starts training, it has very little translation uh, capabilities, but iteratively it improves. And also the, also the, um, uh, the quality of the back translated data improves. The way we train is that we uh, generate the data in every training step. We always generate one, one uh, set of sentences, one mini batch, and uh, that way we uh, we improve it sort of on the fly. Uh, our approach is that we uh, we believe that with training only on the synthetically generated translations, that sometimes the model gets trapped in an optimum which is uh, very low. And uh, especially when uh, one of some of these underlying assumptions is not met, uh, the initialization is not strong enough, and it just doesn't uh, doesn't create a functional uh, empty system. That's why we uh, we this, uh, we try to um, select translation uh, select the um, training examples from the two monolingual corpora in a different way. So not synthetically generate translations, but uh, take two monolingual corpora and match sentences, which could be parallel. Because the assumption is that we, when we have two monolingual corpora, there always are sentences which are equivalent. We only don't have the links. So if we train a model to find these links, then uh, we can uh, present uh, our translation system with these uh, matched sentences for training. So um, here again, uh, you see the, the architecture of, uh, of our neural empty systems. So we always uh, train a bidirectional model. It's uh, it's related to the idea of online uh, of on the fly back translation, where the same model creates its own training examples, and since we always need the model in one direction from source to target, for example, to generate our target sentence, uh, we 
and then we use this sentence to train the other translation direction. So that's why one model has to be has to uh, has to work for translation in both ways. So that's one of the design uh, design attributes of most uh, unsupervised empty systems. So they uh, they translate both from source to target and target to source. This also helps uh, the encoder to create the shared uh, shared latent space for both the source language and the target language. Um, we uh, when we, so that's the design of the model. It's a, tra a transformer system. The baseline is, as I said, trained on uh, on the fly back translation, and uh, we experiment with uh, training on a pseudo viral corpus uh, created by uh, an external uh, external model and uh, and showed to to the system. This way, we. We also uh, check um, the one of our hypotheses, or so we check whether an empty, uh, the unsupervised empty model is able to really fully exploit the cross-lingual signal present in the data. Because uh, what we do when we uh, when we create a pseudo parallel corpus by matching uh, sentences is that we doesn't introduce new data. We only introduce the alignments. So if the model was had already been capable of finding these alignments, it wouldn't need uh, these techniques. But we uh, we try to introduce it explicitly and see whether it leads to an improvement. So how how do we uh, obtain such uh, such pseudo parallel data? Uh, when I say pseudo parallel, I say this because. Um, the most of the sentence pairs are actually not parallel. In the ideal world, we would really be able to find equivalent sentences in two monolingual texts and then call this uh, uh, an automa automatic parallel corpus, but they're more similar than equivalent. So that's why we call this uh, a pseudo parallel corpus because it, does, it, uh, it doesn't always uh, contain parallel sentences. So, um, the way we uh, search for uh, similar sentences or equivalent sentences is that we uh, search in a sentence representation space. So we use uh, a model, a sentence encoder, to encode each of the sentences uh, present in the monolingual corpora. We embed it in, uh, in a high dim dimensional sp space, and we search this space to find the closest, uh, the closest neighbors. Uh, we use uh, we use a metric which is based on cosine similarity, but it's modified a, a little bit, and uh, we um, and uh, we always look for uh, for the nearest neighbors in both uh, in both directions, so, and then we take uh, an overlap of the uh, of the two uh, of all the found uh, sentences. Uh, the the way uh, the way we embed the sentences is uh, based on a sentence encoder uh, showed on this picture. So our sentence encoder is uh, a model called XLM one hundred, which is a cross-lingual mask language model trained on uh, the Wikipedia for one hundred languages, where we. Uh, where uh, it's it's a large model of uh, with sixteen layers and a large uh, embedding size of uh, one thousand two hundred eighty elements, and uh, we found that it's um, that it creates rich uh, that it creates sentence representations with uh, uh, with uh, rich cross-lingual information. So this uh, this model was pre-trained uh, by Kono and Lampel in 2019. We didn't uh, we didn't um, step in that pre-training phase, but we uh, we modified it to improve uh, to improve its cross-lingual capabilities. So uh, we took the pre-trained model and we uh, we hypothesized that if we show it uh, at least a limited portion of uh, synthetic parallel sentences that were created by uh, an unsupervised uh, empty system that we can improve uh, the alignment of its representations. So we, uh, so we, we showed it 
um, synthetic translations uh, from English to German. And we observed whether such, I would say, light uh, translation signal input in, into the model, whether it will bring any benefits. Uh, so we, uh, we uh, found that when, when we work with this large pre-trained model, it, for our cross-lingual tasks, it's the or for the cross-lingual uh, sentence retrieval task, it's the best to look uh, in the mid layers of the model. The, it seems that the final layers are already too um, too specific for the task of masked language modeling that the that the model was pre-trained on. But when we look in in its middle representations, we really uh, find that. Uh, sentence representations of sentences with similar meaning are very close to each other, uh, regardless of their language. In order to be able to test this uh, capability of the model, we evaluated on two tasks. One of them is called parallel corpus mining, where we take a uh, um, where we take a set of monolingual sentences and we, we mix in uh, some small parallel, parallel data. We then train them. Uh, we then test the model whether it's able to reconstruct these uh, parallel sentences which are hidden there, and we can uh, measure recall precision or the F1 score. Another uh, task which is uh, which is easier for the model, but also uh, maybe easier to evaluate for some language pairs where we don't have too much data, is that we can uh, is um, that we only take a, a set of parallel sentences, we shuffle it, and we test whether the model is able to reconstruct it. Here it's easier because it doesn't really have the negative examples. It's only trying to find the, the closest uh, candidate from a pool of, uh, let's say, 2,000 uh, sentences. So we measured, uh, we measured this, and we found that uh, our, if we look at the scores of the only the original pre-trained model, it has some uh, some ability to find these uh, parallel sentences, but uh, its uh, its F one score is only around uh, sixty. With our fine tuning uh, fine tuning uh, strategy, we were able to increase it by up to uh, around 20, 20 points. If we compare it to a supervised baseline, which or not a supervised benchmark, let's say, there the, its uh, ability to find uh, parallel sentences is way higher. But on the other hand, it's a model, uh, the laser model that was trained on a large uh, parallel corpora. So, um, so the, the comparison cannot really be made directly, but just, for, uh, just to have an idea how, how it stands in comparison to supervised uh, models. Uh, the the chart below is uh, shows uh, the accuracy on the the, the shuffling the shuffling task, where we also saw an uh, improvement for our uh, our model. And here we see the evaluation across different la layers of the model, and see what I said before that uh, as we move to the end of the or to the last layer, the uh, the accuracy starts decreasing. So it's the best to take uh, uh, representations from one of the earlier layers. What was interesting here is that we uh, we found that there is an improvement regardless of the language language pair that we used for fine tuning. So, for example, we find you using uh, this um, supervision by Czech German sentences. And we experience an improvement for English French uh, language model for English French retrieval. So uh, it's something that uh, we found quite surprising and that we uh, might want to uh, look into more in the future. Uh, the problem for uh, finding pseudo parallel data for low resource languages is that they're often excluded from these large pre-trained models. For example, the model that we used was only uh, pre-trained for 100 languages. And uh, in our experiments, we worked with a number of languages that were not a part of this set. So uh, we, uh, we fine-tuned uh, the model using the, uh, using the objective of mass language modeling. And uh, we always fine-tuned it on the 
on the low resource languages that we were interested in, plus one of the high resource uh, languages, English or German. Uh, so we uh, we see that at the at the beginning of the training, uh, we see in the chart on the right that the uh, the cap capability of the model to find parallel sentences in mi mixed in uh, in some set of uh, sentences is uh, zero because it really the model just doesn't uh, cannot represent that language. But then as we move uh, further with the pre-training, it starts uh, it starts um, uh, having some uh, some ability to do that. Uh, however, the it's uh, the the precision or the F1 score they're still not very high. So what we saw in the last uh, uh, in the last slide was that we had um, we had a precision around ninety F1 score around eighty, whereas here uh, we uh, we only see F1 score of around up to twenty five, which is not very much. We will uh, I will speak later about how uh, whether this helps or not for uh, in our unsupervised uh, machine translation experiments because we use these models to to create uh, training data for our unsupervised empty models uh, what uh, what we found interesting when uh, when evaluating the uh, or when uh, fine tuning uh, this pre-trained model for new languages was that what works the best is to for, to fine tune for the language that we that we need. So, for example, for for our experiment with the Indic languages, we took all of the four Indic languages, so Assamese, Kasi, Manipur, and Mizo, and English, and we fine tuned on uh, the task of uh, mask language modeling. Then, uh, and that's the results uh, are you can see uh, in the second row for for the Indic uh, languages. Then what we did is that we again employed the same uh, the same fine tuning method that I introduced before that we took the English German small parallel corpus and again fine tuned uh, the model a little bit and we saw very uh, big improvement again. So uh, in case of English SMEs, we even reached uh, uh, an F1 score of, of 47, which uh, uh, considering how remote these languages are and that they use uh, a different script, it's, uh, it's uh, quite uh, a good result. Um, so, um, yeah. Uh, we also wanted to benchmark this again uh, against some other unsupervised models because uh, lately there was a uh, new pre-trained models specialized in low resource languages, the GLOT 500. So we wanted to check whether it's whether it would uh, have uh, better results than our models. And actually we found that it doesn't perform uh, well at all. Uh, it can be, the reason can be that we, um, that uh, we fine tuned our model uh, particularly for the four languages uh, of our interest, whereas the GLOT model was um, trained for 500 languages. Mm -hmm. and, al and also its internal representations are smaller. So it's, it's embeddings that we used for s the search are uh, only 768, whereas our XLM model has uh, 1280. So also there, uh, it can mean that there is uh, more information hidden in, the, in that um, sentence embedding. So let's see uh, how, uh, when now we have the, the sentence encoder, uh, how uh, what kind of improvement can we reach in unsupervised uh, machine translation systems when we introduce this sor source of uh, translation signal into the training? So um, we first experimented with uh, to determine the most efficient way to incorporate uh, pseudo parallel sentences into the training because we hypothesized that uh, since we know that the data is noisy, it includes similar sentences rather than equivalent, it's probably not a good idea to keep it in the training for, for too long. So, uh, we, uh, so we decided to first uh, have the model train itself on uh, both synthetic uh, examples created by back translation and by the pseudo parallel data. 
later on we drop the pseudo parallel corpus and only let it, uh, let the model improve improve itself by the iterative Arabic uh, translation. Um, so let's see how uh, how this strategy performed for our experiments uh, between Upper Sorbian and German. Uh, so here uh, in the uh, the blue lines is our baseline uh, pre-trained uh in the model in the way that uh, i introduced uh, earlier by mass language modeling and uh denoising auto encoding and then uh, uh, trained using online big translation only and we compare it to uh our method which uh which is the so the the orange line is when we only train the model uh, using a combination of synthetic and pseudoparallel data. However, uh, when we when we drop the pseudoparallel corpus, we see all these continuation lines, which uh, reach higher la layer, significantly higher levels than uh, than the baseline. We also observe here, especially in the case from uh, when translating into the low resource language of Upper Sorbian, that. Uh, the translation, the final translation quality improves the longer we let the model train itself on the pseudoparallel data. So that's um, so. In this way, we uh, determine our optimal strategy of just uh, training the model on the combination of pseudoparallel data and synthetic data until convergence, and then uh, dropping it and training further. Uh, here uh, we uh, see uh, the numbers for other languages, uh, not only uh, German Upper Sorbian, but also uh, other uh, three language pairs that we uh, experimented with. And we see that the improvement is significant across all the language pairs. Here we must know that English Kazakh and English uh, Georgian are uh, authentically low resource languages. Uh, and they're also very linguistically dissimilar, uh, linguistically distant, and uh, uh, both of them use a different, uh, a non-Latin script. So already there, the, the conditions are quite adverse, and uh, we see that our method helps, especially in the case of English Kazakh, where uh, the baseline model uh, simply doesn't reach any translation quality. So. Uh, so in this case, it can be viewed that uh, as if the like adding, adding pseudo parallel data actually saves the model from this uh, uh, suboptimal state. State. Uh, we decide to also compare our uh, results to uh, ChatGPT just to see how well uh, large uh, language models. Uh, how well it can, knowing that they have translation abilities for uh, high resource language pairs, just to see whether they can also perform for low resource language pairs. And uh, we see that their performance is not very high. We uh, we looked into the translation and did uh, a small ma manual evaluation. And so that uh, what happens is that often, often the um, a large, uh, the chat GPT uh, output is is a sentence that sounds fluent and has a very similar uh, similar meaning to the uh, to the source sentence, but simply is not is not equivalent and doesn't have the word overlap. So in this case, also it's possible that the blast score mm, kind of uh, puts it puts chat GPT at a disadvantage. But definitely, we we cannot say that chat GPT works well for for the languages that we experimented with. On the other hand, uh, when uh, looking at a uh, high resource language pair, which is English Ukrainian, uh, there the, the performance is uh, is pretty high. Um, then we we ran uh, another round of experiments, and here we will see that how we also hit the the limit of unsupervised MT. And uh, um, even using our technique, we were not able to to uh, make uh, make functional unsupervised translation models. So uh, we see, especially for uh, this, this is the translation to the English Indic languages, especially for Assamese and Manipuri, uh, we reached a very small improvement by uh, or we reached an improvement uh, using our method, but still the absolute uh, translation quality is very low. So it's below two or three three black points, so which is not usable at all. 
We uh, also looked into the translations to have a look even at what, what, what a translation of one black point or two black point looks like. And we saw that actually it's, uh, it's very fluently sounding sentences, only they have a different meaning. But it's, uh, it's, um, what is quite impressive is the model uh, ability to uh, generate a sentence from the same topic, really. So we, we think that uh, using this strategy, not, not, not for uh, translate, uh, translation in these language pairs where we weren't, weren't able to make it work, but using it in high resource scenario, more for um, uh, some style transfer or uh, domain ad adaptation that would actually be usable. Uh, for uh, the other two Indic languages, Mizo and Kasi, we, uh, we obtained uh, slightly better results, even though it's, uh, it's especially in the case of Mizo, it's still, the results are, are low. It's interesting that uh, the Kasi translations are, uh, were, uh, were better than the other languages, even though the uh Kasi monolingual corpus was the the smallest so it was only 200,000 languages no 200,000 sentences uh in order to have an idea of what kind of data we are training our our uh, models on we um we had uh we had a look at um we, we took a random sample of, of the pseudo-barrel corpora in English Assamese and English Kazakh, and we manually evaluated it to, uh, to see the, uh, to kind of uh, assess the level of similarity uh, that, uh, that we have there. And uh, yeah, the results can be seen here in the chart. It's, uh, it's, it's a mix of uh, different uh, kinds of sentences where only a small portion of them is sentences that were considered to be almost equivalent or equivalent or almost equivalent in meaning. A majority of the sentences is um, uh, is sentences that are either dif different in meaning but have the, the same topic uh, or they don't have any similar okay the majority is that they have uh, that uh, Okay, sorry. Once again, <laughs> the majority of the sentences contains equivalent uh, co contains equivalent words, or contains uh, sentences that are very similar but contain a critical translation error. This translation error is what I was talking about earlier when I uh, spoke uh, about the spoke about the problem with named entities. So I said that uh, translating names and numbers is a problem in uh, for unsupervised MT, and it's also a problem for for uh, for this uh, for our sentence encoders when they are looking uh, for equivalent sentences but because often they think that or they consider two uh, sentences equivalent because they really have the same structure only the, the numbers are different and then these these uh, such two sentences have a very high similarity score so we have a lot of these uh, in the in the uh, in the pseudo parallel corpus which is uh, a prob problem because it uh, it, you know, it it doesn't it definitely does not alleviate the problem of uh, mistranslated names which was already present in the uh, in the data uh, so we have such uh, sentences and then uh, uh, some portion also has was considered to have no recognizable similarity and there it's usually sentences that were matched uh, because they only they have the same structure for example it's a short sentence which ends with a with an exclamation mark but it's really the similarity in meaning is just not not there so when looking at the structure of the sentences uh it's quite um surprising that in the case of English and Kazakh, this it really works. We, we uh, it works when we use this pseudo-barrel corpus in training. We saw that it increases the translation quality quite significantly. Okay. So um, uh, it's uh, it's quite surprising, but uh, it's uh, it's it simply introduces some new sort of new source of uh, translation signal that uh, that the model can benefit from and. If we uh, if we drop this pseudo parallel corpus from the training early enough, it it use uh, uh, the model is then able to recover from uh, at least some of the mistakes that it learned uh, from this pseudo parallel corpus. 
In the case of English SMEs, we saw that it uh, didn't work. Uh, we have several ideas why this might be the case, because it doesn't seem to be that the English SMEs corpus is worse than the English Kazakh one. So we think that either uh, the reason was that we our uh, English SME pseudo parallel corpus was smaller than uh, in the case of Kazakh, or that uh, the uh, in the initialization or in the pre-training sta stage, uh, the uh, the English SMEs model simply didn't uh, didn't find an optimal initial solution, which the English Kazakh had. Uh, here again, one more look at the quality of the pseudo parallel data. Uh, here I chose several uh, several sentences from German and Upper Sorbian where uh, we can maybe roughly see the uh, the similarity of, of the sentences or not. Uh, in the in italics, I always um, I always emphasized sentences which uh, uh, emphasized the parts of sentences which were mistranslated. Uh, so um, we see that, for example, uh, when uh, when sentences are, or when there are equivalent names in the sentences, they are matched easily because it's uh, uh, it's it's an easy anchor for the model. Also, when the model includes other other names or numbers, it's all it also often get matched. Sometimes, however, the number is not the same. So that's, for example, the the page uh, the example number three. I think that uh, uh, a novel had uh, one uh, 1,200 uh, pages or the book had 300 pages. So really, the structure of the sentence is the same. Uh, the meaning is similar, but with a, with a bad mistranslation of the number. Um, we also, uh, in the pseudo viral corpus, we also found sentences where uh, the model was really able to find the the equivalence, even though there are no numbers, no names, no English uh, abbreviations that could be used as an anchor. That really the the uh, cross linguality of the representation or the language that it that it really uh, has this ability. For example, the number four, where uh, yeah there are no no names uh, no names or nothing like that it's just a simpler sentence and it has it has a similar meaning uh, in the two sentences and it was matched um, in the last uh, in the example number seven it's an example of that uh, no translation or no semantic equivalence because it's just a sentence that has an exclamation mark at the end but it, the meaning is completely different uh, sentence number six we see again the same structure with the side uh, clause, but it's uh, uh, and and we see the same beginning, but later on the uh, the end of the sentence is completely different. Um, here I wanted to add one more more figure just to show you how uh, how translation quality increases when we have at least a limited number of uh, parallel data. So we participated in a shared task, which was actually focused on semi-supervised translation, not unsupervised. Semi-supervised refers to the scenario where we have uh, several thousand or several tens of thousands of, um, of parallel sentences. We see here in the case of SMEs and MISO, how when we have, uh, when we have uh, around five or 10,000 sentences already, the, uh, the, uh, the the translation quality starts uh, rising quite sharply. When we have uh, fifty thousand sentences, we have quite a, a good translation uh, translation abilities. Uh, the dotted lines are uh, the dotted lines are um, the uh, refer to the unsupervised. Uh, uh, no, the dotted lines uh, refer to the uh, to the systems which include our pseudo parallel corpora because we also wanted to see whether even if we have some limited number of uh, parallel sentences, whether it helps to uh, add some noisy parallel sentences from our sources. And we saw that when we have uh, up to around, or when we have more than 10 or 20,000 of sentences, it's, it's not necessary anymore. When we have less, it still helps. Uh, so, 
what uh, our research aim was to uh, to explore whether unsupervised MT models are able to exploit the uh, the mono, the cross-lingual signal that's present in the monolingual data. And we we saw that it's uh, that it's not that it that it benefits from some explicit signal introduced by uh, by uh, the pseudo parallel data, even though they are they are noisy, but they're introduced explicitly. And uh, we also saw that uh, even though our method can help in some situations, that still unsupervised MT has uh, has many uh, has many difficulties or drawbacks as uh, the limits lie especially in the size of the monolingual data and its do uh, domain overlap uh, and also uh, and also some uh, general uh, general quality re uh, regarding the cleanness of the data whether it doesn't uh, include some artifacts from maybe English or because in in such cases we also saw very adverse um, results uh, that way, uh, for so we we kind of studied this from the theoretical point of view to to um, to try to understand how these unsupervised models work and how to overcome the uh, their problems for actual practical applications of low resource machine translation. Uh, now, uh, with the with the pre-trained models that are available, we think that uh, the the best um, the best way to make a low resource machine translation work would be using pseudo parallel data, but not uh, not using one of our unsupervised uh, sentence encoders, which never saw a translation, but rather using one of existing sentence uh, encoders, which were pre-trained on the high amounts of high resource parallel data that are available for some languages. And uh, uh, some recent articles show how, showed how these uh, large pre-trained sentence uh, encoders can be distilled for new languages using uh, small portions of uh, small portions of parallel data. Uh, so, uh, if such data are not available for uh, for um, a language that we want to translate from, maybe trying to collect at least uh, a limited amount of such uh, authentic uh, translation examples would probably be the best way to really help the language. Uh, for uh, for uh, making a low resource uh, machine translation system, we also uh, think that there is a high potential of uh, using transfer learning from high resource languages, which is a strategy that we also didn't focus on because we really wanted to look at the cases where we have no parallel data at all, not even from other languages. And also the uh, unsupervised pre-training techniques that, we, uh, that I uh, spoke about in the talk. Uh, we also believe that uh, the unsupervised techniques have their applications for high resource machine translation where they uh, can uh, where they can serve for uh, domain adaptation and uh, style transfer. Um, yeah, this is uh, this is just to uh, just to sum up uh, the talk, but I already mentioned most of the uh, most of the points. So uh, we saw that the underlying uh, assumptions of unsupervised MT are not always uh, met and that uh, uh, the performance uh, in such cases can, can be uh, improved by uh, introducing an extra source of translation signal. Such translation signal can be obtained by searching uh, the embedding space uh, for sentence uh, equivalents and uh, uh, using such uh, match sentences for training uh, an empty system. Uh, such uh, training corpus should be removed at uh, a certain point to avoid uh, blocking further uh, learning. And uh, this method, in case we have, uh, we have uh, monolingual text with a domain mismatch that simply speak about uh, different things as uh, as was the case for, uh, for example it's in the indic uh, indic um, empty experiments where the indic corpora included big portions of re religious text then uh, uh, the uh, also this method fails same as the other unsupervised techniques okay uh, so thank you for your attention if you have any question